Good. And we move over and Jennifer is still unmuted. So can you? Yes, very good. All sorted. No worries. Perfect. We haven't started anyway. So share screen and let's hope for the best that this works. And hopefully you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Things work. That's good. That's how I like it. And Bernardo has already posted the link. So thank you as usual. You are a true hero. And I don't know whether you wear a cape, but uh, you know, true superheroes don't always wear capes. Absolutely right. <laughs> what is sauerkraut? Hmm. Yeah, that's the title of the lecture today. Sugar, booze and sauerkraut. Never heard of sauerkraut? You haven't lived. Uh, okay, let's try it in a different way. Ah, uh, oh, interesting. It's fermented cabbage, indeed. I think the Japanese version is called kimchi. And it's incredibly healthy. Oh, it's Korean. Yes, sorry, sorry, my bad. It's a uh, Korean version, kimchi. What's the what's the uh, Japanese version called? I know there's a Japanese version as well. I don't think it is cabbage miso. I think uh, miso is more fermented soy sauce. But uh, at the end of the day, it um, uh, it's sort of, we will come to that. Okay, so let's get started because we have a lot of ground to cover today with uh, this uh, with metabolism. Uh, last lecture, I started with the uh, uh, glycolysis and we basically started off with discussing that um, when we are for example looking at skeletal muscles we have only very very limited energy resources at our disposal thank you very much um, and uh, we have only ATP in our skeletal muscle for about mm, roughly 10 seconds. And that's predominantly in the form of creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate and phosphate, I usually abbrevi abbreviate as a P with a circle around it, which basically means uh, phosphate. This creatine phosphate, um, can transfer the phosphate group onto ADP and with the help of the enzyme creatine kinase, um, it can form 
ATP plus, and of course we have got creatine left. So when we do a lot of strenuous exercise, this ATP then will be uh, very quickly broken down to ADP plus uh, phosphate, inorganic phosphate. So if we do a lot of exercise, a short-term exercise, we accumulate creatine and phosphate. Uh, and also, if we don't have any other means of restoring the system, like for example, um, if we have, let's say, if, if we take, if we are really mean, we take a fish from an oxygenated tank with lots of uh, oxygen in the water and we put that the poor fish into a deoxygenated water. What will happen is that we immediately see uh, an increase in creatine and phosphate because the, uh, the fish doesn't have at the moment doesn't have any other way of restoring uh, ATP levels. So that is what happens in the first 10 seconds for the uh, production of ATP, which we then can use. But what happens after 10 seconds? Well, we need to get more energy and we would get this energy from this process of glycolysis. And again, here is the image and you can find that on, um, yes, you get a very unhappy fish. That's, that's true if you do that. Uh, so here is the process of glycolysis and we briefly went through it. There are lots and lots of very good YouTube videos that really describe what's going on in glycolysis. So we start with uh, glucose we have this first phase, which is the uh, preparation phase. Preparation phase. And in this phase, in this preparation phase, we need two molecules of ATP. So in a way, what we can do in this case, this is glycolysis, yes. We can write, so for the first part, glucose plus 2 ATP. That's the preparation phase. And we also, if we sum it up, um, we then need uh, also two molecules of two NAD plus molecules. We will use these two NAD plus molecules then in the second phase, that is the what is called the payoff phase. And in this payoff phase, we split the glucose into two, three carbon compounds. And eventually we end up with this pyruvate. So you can sum up glycolysis as uh, this reaction, glucose plus 2 ATP plus 2 NAD plus, gives 2 times pyruvate. Pyruvate. This molecule looks like this. COCH3. So it has 3 carbons. Glucose has 6 carbons. So that's why we have 2 uh, pyruvate, and we get in this payoff phase, we actually get two times two molecules ATP back. So we get a total of four ATP plus two molecules of NADH. The answer is yes, eat it. So this is basically the uh, summary equation for uh, glycolysis.
Yes. The answer is yes. So this is glycolysis. And um, however, life is never easy. It looks deceptively simple and basically every single organism on this planet gains energy from glycolysis. Um, the energy is in the form of ATPs. Don't forget the net equation is only two molecules of ATP that we get because we have to invest two uh, molecules of ATP. Uh, so the net equation is just two ATPs and two molecules of NADH, but we still generate ATP. Uh, but there are actually two problems, and these two problems I want to discuss in the session today. So the first problem is on this side of the equation with glycolysis. And the question is, where does the sugar come from? Imagine we are a skeletal muscle and we need to perform some exercise. We want to play football, tennis, or, you know, just uh, go for a run. Yep, the carbohydrates, absolutely. Well, glucose is a carbohydrate. Where does it come from? We need, as a muscle, we need to do some work. It's supplied by the blood. Ultimately, you are absolutely right. But if you are a muscle and you have to, you know, run now, um, there isn't uh, a lot of glucose in the blood, actually. So what would you, does anyone know, uh, what is the uh, usual, usual uh, blood sugar level after, say, three hours after a meal? How much glucose do you have? Eight, nine, what? Bananas? Uh, pretty much. Uh, it, it, yes, uh, it's in the range of four to six uh, millimolar. That's what the usual blood sugar level is after a meal. That's right. Um, if in, in a healthy person. So if you haven't had a breakfast or a lunch, then your blood sugar levels will be in this, uh, and, and that is glucose level. Your glucose level will be around four, four to six millimolar. And in a healthy person, uh, two hours after a meal, that's postprandial, Postprandial, which means after a meal, your sugar levels should be lower than about 7.8 millimolar. That's absolutely right. And if you are above that, then there is an indication for some kind of dysregulation of the carbohydrate metabolism, usually, which manifests itself in some kind of diabetes. Absolutely right. During a meal, uh, you can easily reach 20 millimolar, but uh, that will be very quickly then uh, reduced to lower than, say, seven, uh, eight millimolar, uh, in the uh, in the phase afterwards. So there isn't a lot of glucose hanging around in the blood. And by the way, this uh, 
glucose in the blood is not really used for muscle activity. It is used for the brain because the brain cannot do without any glucose. But Reynolds already said uh, muscles actually can store glucose. Muscle, and these are the skeletal muscles, to be clear. Heart muscle doesn't store a lot of glucose. And the liver. And the liver can store glucose. Although we have to be careful, I put that in quotation marks because it is not glucose that they store. Um, how is the glucose stored in muscle? Does anyone know? Absolutely right. It stores it as glycogen. So glucose is stored as glycogen. And the reason for that is that glycogen is basically um, easier to handle. Uh, it's not soluble in water. Uh, it's basically insoluble in water. And uh, if you were to achieve this, if you want to store glucose, Glucose itself is soluble in water and it would almost bind all the water. So everything in the cell, in the muscle cell, will, would turn into something, the consistency of honey or something. And that can't be good. So therefore, we store glucose as glycogen. So what is glycogen actually? Well, glycogen is a, a large molecule made up of glucose where the glucose is connected by alpha 1 4 glycosidic binding or bonds glycosidic bonds plus uh, alpha 1 6 glycosidic bonds and it is absolutely right, it is branched. So what does it look like? So I'm trying to draw some glucose. And of course, you can all do that as well. So OH, 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 OH. And here we've got uh, C, H two O H. That's position one, two, three, four, five, and six. And in position one, the OH group points downwards, so that means alpha here. And this molecule is connected to another. Uh, glucose molecule OH CH2OH like that and here we have this glycosidic alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond so that is basically uh, the units of uh, glycogen, we can also have a 1,6 bond here. So let's do another one up here. OH, 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 OH. H C H two O H and here we would have a one six. So we have a huge molecules where we have predominantly alpha one four glycosidic bonds, and one in ten of these bonds, roughly one in ten, are also these 
uh, alpha 1, 6. And it's a gigantic molecule uh, that the muscle and the liver stores. The liver can store basically percentage-wise more. Thank you very much. Yes, that's a lovely picture of that. Uh, and uh, in, in plants, it's uh, amylopectin, uh, but in, in animals, this is usually referred to as uh, glycogen. Muscle, uh, liver can per, percentage-wise to its own weight, it can store more glycogen. Muscles, however, we have far more muscle uh, mass than uh, liver, and therefore, if you put that all together, this glycogen store in the skeletal muscle is about three times the size of uh, the liver storage. So this is how we can store glucose. And now we do our running. So we need to get this, uh, uh, the sugar molecules back. Uh, and uh, we uh, need to break down, actually, this glycogen. So how do we do that? Now, there is a really, really clever trick in it, because uh, let's say we've got uh, these glycogen molecules. So we've got, and I write that as gluc1,4, gluc1,4, Look, one, four. So you, you basically get the gist. And here we just uh, do a one, six. Uh, look, something like that, where we've got the, the branch point. And the, so if we do exercise, we, need the glycogen and we've got uh, in a skeletal muscle we've got glycogen for about mm, up to two hours of exercise so it's enough glycogen there uh, in the muscle for two hours of exercise uh, but also in the resting muscle, uh, we, the muscle will use glycogen. So we have enough glycogen for about uh, 16 hours, roughly 16 hours of rest. Uh, after that, the glycogen stores are pretty much depleted. Um, and therefore, you feel, for example, hungry, something that we will discuss on Friday, what happens. You are not necessarily starving, but your glycogen stores will be reasonably depleted. So how can we use this uh, glu uh, glucose storage for the purpose of the muscles? Yes, we use glycogen when we rest. Uh, that's absolutely right. So there is a little bit of uh, turnover when uh, we rest. And uh, very often, uh, that, that is basically why people want to have breakfast, right, after 16 hours or so. So how do we use this? Now, that's quite, uh, quite fascinating. I, I think this is quite fascinating because this glycosidic bond, this glycosidic bond, actually contains still energy. So in glycosidic bond, energy is stored. Energy is stored. There is energy in this bond. And if we just simply do the reverse reaction of this condensation, so if we just add water to this molecule, so O, let me see if I can draw this properly. So 
So if we just add water to this, this would be, what would you call this process? If you add water and break that bond. Absolutely right. Yes, that's hydrolysis. It's not hydration, it's hydrolysis. It's the opposite of condensation. So we would get this out here. OH plus So if we do, absolutely right. Uh, if we do hydrolysis, we would waste this energy that is stored in here. So that's not a terribly economic uh, way of dealing with it. Instead, what actually happens is, we carry out a slightly different process. We add a phosphate group. And what we get from this is, there is enough energy to use a phosphate And we still get the OH group like that. And that is exactly what I'm describing. And I was just about to ask you what you would call a process that looks like this. So when we use water, we, we, it's called hydrolysis. But we are not using water, we are using phosphate group. What would you, it's, what would you call it? It's not, strictly speaking, uh, phosphorylation, Adam. Uh, it is, and uh, James is uh, right, it is, uh, Phos phospholysis. It's a phospholysis, phospho and lysis as splitting. Right? So we use phosphate, and this process is catalyzed by an enzyme called phosphorylase or glycogen phosphorylase. So glycogen phosphorylase uses phosphate instead of water to chop off a glucose molecule from the end and produces, what would you call this molecule here? This bit here. What molecule is that? How would you call that? What molecule is that? Absolutely right. This is actually glucose 1-phosphate. Totally right. And you see, that's the great thing if you think about it. Have we used, did we use a molecule of ATP for the production of this glucose 1-phosphate? Have we used any ATP? No, we haven't used any ATP. 
So this is the beauty of using glycogen, because remember, when we just use glucose, the first step for the glycolysis is actually we need to use ATP to get a phosphorylated glucose here. In this case, it's glucose 6-phosphate. Ah! So we are basically not have to invest a molecule of ATP. We get already a glucose 1-phosphate. But wait a moment. Um, it's glucose 1-phosphate. Uh, what do we need for uh, glycolysis as the step? Ah, yeah, we need the 6-phosphate. How do we get from glucose 1-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate? Hmm. Turn it around. <laughs> uh, sort of. Actually, we employ an enzyme as usual, and this is just simply an intramolecular shift of the phosphate group. We don't need any uh, other molecules for that. We just need an enzyme. And these enzymes, they are called mutases. So here we have a mute, mute, sorry, I can't spell, mutase. A mutase. A mutase will convert glucose 1-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate. And as I said, mutases are enzymes that convert the shift of a phosphate group within a, a substrate molecule. And then we end up with our glucose 6 phosphate. So, from the glucose 6 phosphate, then we can go into our glycolysis and we can actually then go through the glycolysis. But here we had to invest only now one molecule of ATP because the first molecule of ATP that we used to invest when glucose just simply comes in into the cell, we don't need to use because we are using glycogen. And with glycogen, we can do phosphorylation, uh, 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 phosphorylase reaction. And from there, then, we can go into this uh, glycolysis process, and we can produce NADH. And we also, as I said, we produce this ATP. Now, big question, ATP here, this ATP that we produce in this step in glycolysis, do we need oxidative phosphorylation for this? Do we need, for the production of this ATP here, do we need oxidative phosphorylation? Absolutely, we don't need oxidative phosphorylation for the production of these ATPs here. These ATPs are simply produced from the substrate, directly from the substrate. And therefore, these two ATPs, or in fact, because we run this twice, this, this ATP production is called substrate level. Substrate, substrate. 
eight level phosphorylation. We don't need to feed anything at that point into the uh, respiratory chain, and it can be a totally uh, anaerobic process. Substrate level phosphorylation does not require oxidative phosphorylation. It does not require oxygen. Absolutely right. So we can use the glycogen to go in there and we produce some ATP by using up the glycogen. Absolutely right. There is a slight problem because the glycogen phosphorylase cannot deal cannot deal with the G16 gluc I should say gluc 16 bonds So the phosphorylase cannot deal with these 1,6 uh, bonds, but this then is dealt with, this bond is phosphorylized, phosphorylized, that's a complex word, is, for, is phosphorylized by an enzyme Actually, it's several enzymes by enzymes called debranching enzymes. The debranching enzymes. So basically, we have the material to use the glycogen that is stored in the muscle when we need it. And we can chop down the glycogen, that's the storage form of glucose, into suitable um, breakdown products, into glucose phosphate, originally glucose 1-phosphate, but that can be easily converted into glucose 6-phosphate. And uh, this process is actually fairly, fairly quick. And we can use the sugar, the glucose, uh, to generate ATP molecules through substrate level phosphorylation. So we don't need any oxygen or anything like that. And we can actually use this uh, glycogen for the muscle to do some work, to run or do something else. It's phosphor phosphor phosphorylase. It lyses the bond with phosphor or phosphate. It's not phosphorylated. It is a phosphorylysis. It's a different thing. Phosphorylated means transferred from usually ATP. In this case, we have phosphate transfer and lysis at the same time. So I hope that makes sense. So. Again, we have glucose or let's say glycogen, glucose, and um, we then have. Now, let me let me write this in a different. Let's take the glycogen away. So we've got the glucose plus. NAD plus actually two gives us two times pyruvate COCH3 plus two ATP plus two NADH. Okay, so that's basically what this what the net. Uh, production, what the next reaction of glucose is. And this is actually a fairly fast process. 
So we gain two molecules of ATP, but actually it's not a terribly far, uh, it's not a terribly efficient process because we still have a lot of energy in this pyruvate, but we uh, get ATP from it. Right, where does the NADH go? Where does NADH go? What do we do with the NADH? Yeah, where does it go? Absolutely right. It goes into the uh, respiratory chain, into the oxidative phosphorylation. So here we go, respiratory chain, respiratory chain, and we produce ATP, and roughly per molecule of NADH, we get roughly 2.5 molecules of ATP. Right. Doesn't go into the Krebs cycle. We haven't heard anything about the Krebs cycle so far. Now, this process, this uh, move to the respiratory chain and then the oxidative phosphorylation is very slow. It's a very slow process. So, can you see a problem with that? The NADH is removed very, very slowly. What is the consequence of that? Glycolysis is a very fast process. very fast. The removal of the NADH is a very slow process. And you can use any decent, any decent biochemistry textbook. Yes, Vernon, you're absolutely right. NADH, we build up NADH. We gain lots of NADH. What's the consequence? We have lots of NADH. What happens to NAD plus? So we get an NADH build up. What happens to NAD plus? Smashing, Ellie. NAD plus is depleted. Because all of our NAD is in the NADH form and we have no NAD plus left. Okay, so if we have no NAD plus left, what happens to our glycolysis? If there is no NAD plus is left, what will happen to glycolysis? Absolutely right. Glycolysis stops. slows down, stops. What happens to ATP? Because we generate ATP through glycolysis.
What happens to our ATP levels? ATP <laughs> plummet as well. Absolutely right. So we need to come up with a clever idea how we can actually move or remove the NADH. And luckily, muscles have a fantastic system of dealing with that. Because in a muscle, what the muscle can do is it can say, right, I use the NADH plus, hey, here it comes. I use one of the products of glycolysis. I use this compound here. I use pyruvate. And with the help of the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase, I convert that into NAD plus, I transfer the electrons plus this compound here. This compound is lactate. And that's all happening in the cytoplasm. This is the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. And you have encountered that in the assessed practical. This is the reaction that happens in the muscle. This lactate then, so what the muscle gains is they gain back NAD+. So the NADH that they generate here, they transfer onto pyruvate. They transfer it onto pyruvate with the enzyme uh, lactate dehydrogenase. They regain NAD+, and this NAD+, helps the glyco uh, glycolysis to run again. But now we've got lactate here. What do we do with the lactate? There's a very clever trick. The lactate in the muscle is actually transported in the blood to the liver. And in the liver, this lactate is then converted, and we discussed that on Friday, into glucose again. And this glucose is transported back in the blood to the muscle. So the muscle produces the lactate to gain NAD plus. The lactate goes to the liver. The liver converts it into glucose and delivers the glucose back to the muscle. This actually, this mechanism is called the Cori cycle because it was discovered by two Canadian uh, physiologists, Corey and Corey, who actually discovered this uh, really uh, useful mechanism. And because of the Corey cycle, the muscle doesn't run out of NAD+. All the NADH that the muscle generates is reclaimed it is converted to back to NAD plus by transferring the electrons to pyruvate where we form a lactate. The lactate goes to the liver and is converted into glucose. And it is a cycle, absolutely right. Now, 
Here's the problem. What do organisms do who don't have a liver? They surely face exactly the same problem. They have to make lactate. What do organisms do who don't use oxygen? Organisms that don't use oxidative respiration. What do they do? Actually, they do exactly that. They do NADH plus pyruvate NAD plus, which goes back into glycolysis, where you get ATP from, plus lactate. And this lactate then is secreted. This is fermentation. These bacteria, for example, get rid of this product, lactate, and that is how they make kimchi or sauerkraut. That's fermentation, that's a fermentation process. They don't use the lactate, like for example, in the liver to make glucose from it. They just basically wee it out. And that's what we eat uh, when we have, uh, let's say, uh, fermented products. Or the alternative is, what we can also do is, which is probably more palatable for many of you, NADH plus pyruvate we can actually take away this CO so this is going away as carbon dioxide and we can then transfer the NADH onto what's left. And again, we get NAD plus back. What do we uh, get then if we transfer electrons onto this thing? What could we get? We could get H3C in the first place we get this one. And if we transfer another NADH onto this, we get H3C, CH2, OH. And this is alcoholic. Well, if you like, fermentation as well. So this process here is predominantly found in yeast. When yeast doesn't have oxygen. And this one here is pyruvate, yes. So alcoholic fermentation happens if yeast uh, doesn't have enough oxygen, so it tries to regain the NAD+, plus, which is required for glycolysis, by transferring the NADH onto decarboxylated pyruvate. 
And that's why I called this session today sugars, glycogen, booze, and sauerkraut. So I hope you enjoyed that. I am reasonably hungry now. And as I said, any decent um, biochemistry textbook has all these processes described, but there's also an online book. It's the fifth edition of uh, Berg, Timochuk and Stryer, which I posted the link for, uh, where you have everything online and you don't have to uh, fork out a lot of money. So uh, if you don't have any questions, thank you very much. And I hope you learned something from it. Take care and be good. And I shall see people who are doing BI3 or 8 tomorrow for a little bit more statistics. And don't forget, Friday we have two sessions. Take care. Bye-bye.